Council meeting for uh, Tuesday, December 12th will come to order. I apologize uh, for the tardiness of the start, but uh, we had a few housekeeping things that uh, keep popping up. And um, so we'll, if you would please stand and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All council members are here and present. And uh, at this time, I'd like to call on the city attorney, Jeff Molloway. Thank you, Mayor and Council. We have a request from staff tonight to add a closed session item to our closed session agenda tonight. And uh, this requires a four out of five council members to vote yes, because we're adding it on the same night as the agenda, uh, as the meeting. Um, and this is because the need for this item arose after the posting of the agenda last Friday and that there is need for uh, action before the council's next regular meeting. So I would request that, the, uh, or I need to read the item. The item is liability claims. Claimant, Sylvia Lamas. Agency claimed against is the city of San Dimas. So it's consideration of a liability claim. So I'd ask that the council make a motion uh, to add that closed session item tonight. And it will need to pass by four out of five uh, yes votes. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries 5 0. We'll have a closed session matter after. Tonight we have the uh, pleasure and a great honor to uh, uh, recognize Gary Enderly from the San Dimas Heroes, who is retiring. I don't think he's retiring. I'm hearing that he's retiring, but I think he'll always be around as long as that monument's around. So, but I just would like to read a little thing and then ask Gary to come up. The city of San Dimas hereby acknowledges Gary Enderly as a longtime San Dimas resident and the co-founder of the San Dimas Helping Establish a Remembrance of Every Service Person, better known as the Heroes organization dedicated to remembering the service members of the, of the city of San Dimas community. Since its groundbreaking on Flag Day, June 14, 2011, the San Dimas heroes have impacted many with the banner program, the establishment of the permanent veterans memorial, and the annual veterans parade, and assisting families of the men and women who, has, who have served and are serving. The City Council extends its appreciation and gratitude and offers their congratulations on his retirement. In witness thereof, I, Mayor Emmett G. Badar, have hereon set my hand and caused the seal of the City of San Dimas to be affixed this 12th day of December, 2023. Gary, would you join me up at the front? And I... Something a little different. I would like to request that all council join me at the podium with them. At the same time, can I ask our committee members that are here to come up also? Anybody you want. This is your day. Mine does. Your number outnumbers my number. My name is not Gary. <laughs> Come on in, get in here and get a picture. And Gary, if you'd like to say a few words afterwards, feel free.
Again, thank you for the recognition. I really appreciate it. Um, I didn't know I was getting flowers, though, but uh, thank you. Um, first of all, again, I'd like to thank you. And as a president of a nonprofit organization, I've always believed that a president is only good as his committee. It's one reason why I asked the committee to come up here. A lot of them aren't here, but I would like to uh, extend my thoughts and extension to uh, those members that aren't here also. Uh, with that said, some of the committee members, like I said, are here. Some of them aren't. So uh, I'd like uh, them to be recognized too. Um, thank you on behalf of all your hard work and all your dedication to the Heroes and the Heroes Monument and the, uh, the mission statement of the Heroes. Um, in closing, I would like to share a few things that I'm proud of and thankful for the establishment of the Heroes family. Uh, one, um, thanks, thankful for all of the committee members who have supported the Heroes organization for more than 10 years. Uh, thankful that the monument was paid for by donations only. We did this without asking the city for any money. Uh, we're proud that we were able to raise $350,000 to build a monument and to have continued uh, maintenance. Uh, I'm also proud that, that the accomplishment we did were there uh, people, were there people who said, there were people that said that uh, we wouldn't be able to do it because we didn't raise the money. Uh, but I want to thank all those that did donate and uh, prove that we were able to raise it. Um, I'm proud and thankful to all those people who supported and the four and 500 people that always came to our veterans event. Uh, thankful for our sponsors that stepped up to the plate on Veterans Day. I'm proud that I have the opportunity to co-chair with Janie Grafe in the startup days of the Heroes Organization. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the city. The city gave us the property to put the monument on. Obviously, if we didn't have property, we wouldn't have a monument. So certainly appreciate all that. Uh, and I would just like to extend a happy, blessed uh, Christmas to everybody and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. We'll move on to oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the city council on any item on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comments will not be taken uh, during each individual item, except for public hearing items. Comments up on public hearing items will be heard when that item is scheduled to be for discussion. Under the provisions of the Brown Act, the legislative body is prohibited from engaging in discussions on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. However, your concerns may be referred to a staff or set for discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Madam Clerk. Speaker cards. Our first speaker would be Rachel Bertakos. Hello. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, staff, and of course, our community. Uh, my name is Rachel Bertakos. I am here to announce my candidacy for District 3 City Council position. I am very happy to be here. As many of you know, I grew up here in San Dimas. I'm raising my children here and I'm involved in many local volunteer organizations. As a candidate and potential City Council member, I pledge to do what's best for San Dimas and to lead with integrity. I very much am looking forward to a fair and respectful election. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, no further speaker cards. At this time, anyone wishing to speak to the city council who hasn't submitted a card, feel free to come up to the uh, podium. Seeing none, we'll move forward. Um, Brad, could I see you for just a moment, please?
I'm sorry, I'm going to remove Gary's flowers. Uh, I can't see the, uh, the audience, and I want to see this guy sitting right out front. Thank you. All, uh, we're going to move to the consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion unless a member of the city council requests separate discussions. At this time, I'm going to call on the city manager. Uh, we had actually 16 items on the, uh, on the consent calendar, and over half of them were being pulled for one reason or another for, for further discussion. So, and uh, city manager will go through that list. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, item 12 will be removed completely from the agenda and no decision will be taken on that item at this time. Um, I'd like to ask, just to make sure I got the numbers correctly, I have items five, six, eight, nine, and 10 to be pulled for discussion. Is there any other items that the council desires? Uh, yes, um, items five and six, uh, I believe are being pulled by council member Vienna. Items eight. Councilman or Eb Ebner. Council member Ebner. That's the only one surprisingly. Council member, uh, item nine is council member uh, Nakano and item 10 is council member Weber. Correct. All right. Hold on, let me just make sure I get this. This just became a 1 a.m. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to get a motion and I'll just go through the items so people are aware of them. Item one, a resolution regarding demands on prepaid warrants. Item two, approval of the November 28th, 2023 regular city council meeting minutes. Item three, denial of the claim of Acevedo versus city of San Dimas. Item four, authorizing the city manager to enter into a professional services agreement with Keith Bachelor for four Gold Line Bridge murals in the amount of $74,000 and a professional services agreement with the Los Angeles Metro Gold Line Foothill Transit Authority to install said mural tiles on the bridge. Item seven, consideration and approval of the program policies and procedures for the permanent local housing allocation rental assistance program and approval of an expenditure and offsetting revenue budget appropriation in fund 40 for this PLHA funds in an amount not to exceed 215,696. Items 11, approve an agreement with the University of Laverne for the operations of the city's government educational access channel KWEST at an annual cost of $98,000 with annual escalator of 3% per year for a period of up to three years. Item 13, appropriate $40,000 from the equipment replacement fund, fund 70, and authorize contract expenditures for outfitting of unit 28 with California Truck Equipment Company for an amount not to exceed $40,000. Item 14, receiving and filing the November 2023 investment report. Item 15, approve an administrative services agreement between the city of San Dimas and the San Dimas Housing Authority in an estimated amount of 316,000. And number 16, receive and file the city's annual independent audited financial statements. With that, I ask for a motion, second, and vote. So moved. I'll second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries five, five zero. All right, which one are we gonna take first? So Mr. Mayor, item number five is the approval of a first amendment to the joint use agreement between the city of San Dimas and the Bonita Unified School District for joint use, operation, and maintenance of recreational facilities at the Sportsplex, revising cost reimbursement related to the varsity baseball field and revising agreement renewal provisions. With that, I'll turn it over to the uh, council member Vienna. I actually, for five and six, I'm hoping staff will present the item. Oh, okay. Good evening, Council. Scott Wasserman, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, item five on the consent calendar. Uh, as the city manager mentioned, it is approval of the First Amendment to a joint use agreement between the City of San Dimas and Bonita Unified School District 
for the joint use, operation, and maintenance of recreation facilities uh, at the Sportsplex. So the city of San Dimas and the Bonita Unified School District have a joint use agreement that goes back to the late 80s. And under the agreement, the city maintains the Sportsplex and the school district reimburses the city for half of that expense. Um, the purpose of this agreement, the amendment, um, is really to transfer the entire financial cost of maintenance of the varsity ball field to the Bonita Unified School District. And there are two reasons for this. One is that um, the city doesn't ever use this area. We're not allowed to use that area. It's kind of an off-limits area. Um, and then the second reason, about a year ago, there was a group, um, there was a lack of clarity as to who was maintaining the varsity ball field. And we have this contract, of course, that says that the city should be maintaining it. At some point, the baseball coach asked uh, if the city would stop maintaining it so that they could maintain it to a higher level. Ultimately, we received complaints about the condition of the ball field. So this caused us to circle back with the school district and make sure we're on the same page with how this is to be maintained and the best means possible. Um, so in discussions with the school district, they were in agreement with this particular amendment that transfers the financial responsibility for the maintenance of the varsity ball field exclusively to the school district. It will be uh, it's approximately $18,000 um, currently, they reimburse us for half of that, $9,000, if the council uh, authorized the city manager to enter into this agreement, they would begin reimbursing the city for the full cost of the maintenance of the varsity ball field. One more item to that is providing clarity to the termination provision. So the contract will renew annually unless we provide a notice by March 1st of each year of our intent not to continue the agreement. All right. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, I wanted this item brought forward for two reasons. Number one is just about a year and a half ago or so when I got more involved with the ad hoc committee, we started really looking at the equity in terms of the agreement of resources. And I think this highlights just one of those strides that the city's taken to be able to look at where, yes, we work collaboratively with the district to be able to ensure that we have good resources for our young people and for the community, but also where there's aspects of it where it wasn't financially uh, in the city's best interest, which is our responsibility as stewards of the taxpayers of the residents of this city and community. So thank you for staff. I really appreciate the work that you did with this and I'm appreciative to the district and the school board members uh, for seeing this uh, common sense, I think, uh, for the purposes of the city of San Dimas. So unless anyone has anything else, I would move approval of this item. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item six is approve a professional services agreement between the city of San Dimas and Griffin Structures to provide cost estimates for maintenance, repairs, and rehabilitation of the recreation center located at 990 West Covina Boulevard in an amount not to exceed $10,650. And with that, I will turn it to the director, Scott Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Constantine. Um, so we have the recreation center. It was built in the late 80s and it, it needs a lot of work. And the last study, I understand that predating my time with the city, there were some studies that were done specifically with consultants to give us an idea of the scope of work and the cost and what is actually needed at the facility. Um, the last such study was performed in 2013 <laughs> by Griffin Structures. And that's actually who I sought out for this proposed contract. What I'm asking them to do is essentially take their findings that they had from the last study, just update everything so that we can have an accurate, I can present to the city council an accurate cost estimate uh, for various scenarios of rehabilitating the facility should council choose to move in that direction. So Scott, thank you. Um, the reason I asked for this item to be pulled is uh, yes, in 2013 that happened, but since I've been elected in 2017, uh, I recall the council with the previous parks director with Teresa, uh, seeing a lot of different conceptual ideas of things and ideas to do to rehab that place. I want to know, to, and I want assurances that we're not just gonna keep, and this really isn't for you, it's really for council, that we're just not gonna keep pissing money away at this problem 
We talked about this almost three budget cycles ago, and the city needs to address this facility. And uh, uh, you know, the swim uh, the swim team came out, and parents and all that, and that's great. But one of the chief utilizers of this facility is in fact the district. Is that not correct? That's correct. So we have another situation, kind of like item number five, where the city is really the one paying for this asset and it's to a loss, is it not? Correct. I mean, not that we're in it to make money, but I mean, we are grossly losing money and it is a drain on the finances. Is that That's, a fair characterization? Yes. And it needs a lot of work? Yes. So I'm supportive of this item, um, but I hope, and I really call on my colleagues here as we move forward to critically look at this and seriously consider the steps that we need to take to address this facility, uh, even if that means a closure. And I think that in the next 24 to 36 months, um, that's probably gonna be a more serious conversation than the one we had within the last 36 months about this. Uh, I hope there's opportunities and I know the city manager, and I know Parks and Rec has worked to look at public-private partnerships. I know we've reached out to Life Pacific University. We've pretty much thrown out, I think, every lifeline that we can to try to figure out how to solve this problem um, without reducing services. Uh, but unfortunately, I do think we are getting to a point um, where the people in the community need to understand that. And I think they also need to understand you know, that the school district being one of the highest utilizers of this particular facility. Um, and we've talked to them about this, so this isn't anything uh, new for them, that perhaps it is uh, in their interest uh, to look at that facility and perhaps for the city to transact that facility uh, to them um, for, for some sort of arrangement. But if not, then I think the prudent and responsible thing is for us to make some difficult decisions, and that may be investing in it if that's what the public wants. Um, but needless to say, uh, thank you. Uh, and unless any of my colleagues have any further comments on that, yep. I do, Scott. Would you mind uh, articulating what some of the scenarios might be to Councilmember Vienna's point? Sure. I mean, uh, one scenario will likely be what would it cost just to fix the pools and the outdoor, the pool decks? Another scenario, too, uh, might be the pool ducks plus something in the locker, I mean, additional things, right, in the locker room. I think it really depends on how we wanna use the facility as we move forward. Part of the discussion will be um, the usage patterns, right? The extent to which it's used by uh, San Dimas residents versus non-residents. It's about 50-50 in the two years that I've been here. Uh, and then the third, I'm sorry, a third scenario would be what would it cost to literally knock it down and build it back up? And that would include reimagining even a larger pool or something else. I know that there's been discussion about putting in a, um, uh, a facility or a pool that is uh, up to standard for competitive reasons. Correct. Okay. Potentially, yes, correct. Okay. It, it really request, depends on council's direction. Yeah, I would request that that be looked correct. at as well, since that is some chatter that I've heard. Also, in addition to that, is to establish the baseline. We currently estimate about a general fund subsidy of about $700,000 for the facility. So we want to start off first with this is where we are. Here's the next step up, the next step up, and then the you know kind of the longer step of a larger full reconstruction facility to provide the council with the right information to understand it's not just the construction cost. It's also going to be the operating cost for either of those scenarios and to be able to get better information to determine what direction you, you would like us to take. Thank you. And pickleball. Let's not forget pickleball. Well, I, and I just wanted to say uh, briefly that uh, all options should be on the table, as Agreed. my colleagues have, have mentioned. And uh, I like the word reimagining. It would be interesting to see what some of those envisions could be for a, for a facility there. And then what the subsidy is and whether we're getting a benefit for that subsidy um, that's never going to be as a park or other uh, public facilities uh, for recreation usually aren't. They're not going to be self-sustaining budget-wise. Um, so there's some amount of money we would subsidize it and, and be happy with. But if it's uh, if we're getting better bang for the buck elsewhere, then maybe that's something we just want to look at. So, so anyway, exploring all these options and this particular item tonight with uh, the consultant, um, I'm definitely supportive of it. I have, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Uh, go ahead. I have one additional request in terms of benchmark. If you could also provide information about 
what subsidies other cities provide to their pool facilities. So that way we're not just looking at the benchmark in terms of where we are currently, but we're comparing it to other cities who have pools and what that looks like, be it 100,000, a million, you know, whatever it is, I think it'd be useful to see. Is not to get too far into the weeds, I understand that we're saying that it's costing us about 700000 a year to keep the doors open. Correct. Okay. And how much money do you believe we're bringing in annually, which, which is, you know, I believe to be the school district plus San Dimas Aquatics and any other organization or whatever, it's just a, a round number. <laughs> I don't have that number at my fingertips. Mr. Mayor, I believe that. And again, I would have to look back at the numbers. The number of the total cost is in excess of about a million, a million two in that range. And so subsidy would reflect the fact that we're getting about $350,000. The largest share coming from uh, Bonita Unified as well as a private uh, club team that came from Claremont that's at our facilities. That would be San Dimas Aquatics? Correct. In terms of the memberships, when we did our fee study, um, it really jumped out when you looked at the per unit, per member cost of what the true cost of facilities, I believe the number was in excess of $2,000 a person when you looked at the memberships of how much you would have to charge to get full cost recovery. So we already know this facility will not be full cost recovery, but that not, isn't necessarily what is the trend. It's just a matter of how much of a subsidy we're willing to incur and what does that mean for all our other programs and services? Because while we may find, and I agree we should look at what other cities' costs are, but also benchmark against the revenue they derive, um, what is okay for one city may not necessarily be okay for us given how much revenue we're generating when we took, take a look at what does that mean for other programs and services. And so I, I think the best approach is do the analysis first, add on to that, the analysis of what's happening to other cities, I mean, how much of a subsidy, how much of a revenue, and then talk about if you kept this facility with its subsidies at the different options, what does that mean for us and other programs? Yeah. I'm um, very much encouraged by the questions of my colleagues and staff's responses, so I look forward to hopefully making a lot of progress and headway on this item. With that, I'll move approval as uh, recommended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Closed. Hearing none, motion carries. 5 0 for uh, consent item number six. Next. Next item is number uh, item number eight approve a contract between the city of San Dimas and consultant Lori Hall McNary with Rockin LD Equine Education Services for equestrian consultant services in an amount not to exceed $9,540 and authorize the city manager or his designee to execute the contract. I will turn it over to Council Member Ebener, who made the request to pull us in. I just thought this deserved a brief report from, again, Scott Wasserman, because uh, it involves uh, quarterly inspections of the San Dimas Equestrian Center, um, which is, has been on uh, the front of a bunch of people's minds for quite a while. Thank you, Council Member Ebener. Um, as you mentioned, the city conducts quarterly inspections of the facility, and uh, early on, I decided, I, I, we decided we really wanted to make sure that these are relevant, that we're looking at things that count, that are important, that are going to matter to the boarders. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'd like to bring on board um, Lori Hall McNary. She's a consultant. I've used her before for the last two inspections, and she's a wealth of knowledge, She's actually a certified, she's certified to, to uh, accredit equestrian facilities and basically carry out site inspections. So what she's doing is she's helping us uh, develop maintenance standards and make sure that they, that the lease operator is living up to those standards. I appreciate that. Um, if there is no more discussion, I would move. Any, any questions? I'll just make a comment that, you know, Years ago, this was something that really started with our equestrian commissioners bringing to light issues related to boarding. And, you know, the commission, coupled with the council, uh, working with staff, took a serious look at those concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think you coming on board and the leadership that's been here in the city has really helped us uh, with the city attorney to be able to look at a very challenging situation uh, that has been quite the yo-yo. but. Uh, 
I appreciate everything that's being done. And this I think is one thing that lends itself towards accountability in the city to make sure we're providing great services and looking out for the animals. And so I'm very grateful for that and great work. Keep doing what you're doing. Any further questions? Do I have a motion? I'll move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. We'll move on to uh, consent item number nine. Item number nine, adopt a municipal code text amendment to amend chapter 18.42, multiple family zone to reduce the required amount of open green areas, open space, and the required front and side yard setbacks for developments in the multifamily zone and chapter 18.156, vehicle parking and storage with respect to vehicle parking requirements for multifamily developments along the associated cleanup items. And I will turn it over to Councilmember Nakano who requested that. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, I believe I've expressed my concern about this one and the amount of um, the amount of space that we're requiring for setbacks. Anything else? I just wanted this pulled as separately. Uh, I don't need to readdress those issues, but I just wanted it pulled separately so we could vote on it again. And my vote is consistent with my previous statements. Thank you. I'll move approval of this item, uh, understanding Councilmember Nakano's wish. Second. All all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries four, uh, four with one, of, uh, no, Councilman uh, Nakano. Okay, we'll move on to uh, consent item number 12, or. Uh, item number 10. 10. Approve a five-year agreement with Flock Group Incorporated to lock in the current pricing for maintaining the 14 cameras currently in place, as well as the cost to install additional cameras that may be authorized over the next five years. With that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Weber, who pulled the item. Uh, thank you for pulling this aside to have a separate discussion on it. Uh, my main reason for pulling it uh, isn't to get a full staff report on this. Uh, I don't need one, at least. I don't know about my colleagues, but... Uh, I just wanted to highlight this particular program in the city. It's been in place for two or three years now, I think, since we, uh, we took a look at this and voted on it and implemented it. I think uh, in that time, it's really proved itself and as a, uh, a critical public safety tool, and it's made a significant uh, impact locally here with crime. Um, and uh, maybe a, a quick brief um, kind of vision as to what your thoughts are as to what the next five years looks like since we're obligating ourselves to that and uh, and the potential to grow the system to uh, to make it more robust. Thank you, Councilmember Weber. Um, the Administrative Services Director had presented this astutely to ensure that we're able to cap the pricing knowing that we were going to keep the cameras for the next five years, so we'll derive some savings. Um, leveraging technology um, in law enforcement has become a very powerful and central theme that you're seeing our flock camera system, we started deploying some of the cameras. We're now up to 14. We have private HOAs who have also been deploying those cameras, which add to the full cadre of cameras that are all integrated, not just within San Dimas, but they're all integrated regionally. And so where a city, uh, let's say Beverly Hills, enters a vehicle that's uh, a dangerous, wanted uh, murder suspect, when that vehicle comes into the city of San Dimas, we get the alerts at the Sheriff's Department. They're able to respond very quickly. And so our vision is to leverage that technology throughout the city. And in terms of the strategy that we've been using, um, initially we were identifying you know, all the different corridors and we installed these cameras on different corridors coming in and out of the city. Um, but we started to also look at not only egress and ingress points, we also started to look at areas of the city that were geographically separate from the remaining parts of the city. Now, law enforcement can get from one side of the city to the other very quickly. <laughs> but we do have some geographical areas, the Via Verde area on the southwest side and the Terrebonne area on the north side of town, that if you're on one side or the other, it's a fair distance away. And so having as much of an early warning when you're in those areas makes it a lot easier to start deploying resources to those locations. So we've been locking down those geographically disparate areas so that when something occurs, we're able to respond quicker. And so the strategy will be um, rather than trying to accommodate everything in the city all at the same time is to be strategic about the areas that we start to concentrate those cameras and then to leverage private entities, whether it be HOAs or be shopping center owners, to encourage them to place cameras of their own choosing with Flock at their own cost to multiply the effect that our cameras have, but for us to continue adding cameras throughout the city. 
Um, if I may, Council, I do need to clarify an item uh, written on the agenda for this item. Um, when I first started drafting the report, I was under the impression that this was part of the agreement. However, um, I later got clarification, but apparently I forgot to, or I wasn't able to remove this sentence. Uh, the contract will be locking in the maintenance and operation costs. Uh, keep that still for five years. However, the installation of cameras, the pricing will change after January. So that, that will not be locked in. That will have a, an increase starting January 1. So it's 3000 though for... Yeah, the 3000 for each camera is still going to remain for the five years. Thank you. Any further questions? I just uh, a comment on this. Um, one, I appreciate staff and the work that's been done here with this. I know when we uh, went and looked into investing in this that uh, there was some community concern. I think that, um, you know, your example, I don't know if you're dyslexic, but uh, your example, Beverly Hills actually leveraged Flock, and I know what you were doing with that, but Beverly Hills actually leveraged Flock um, to be able to capture the person that committed the murder of our resident. And so I think that, you know, the city invested in this technology and in the scenario the city manager outlined, if it was the opposite and that person found himself here uh, or whoever, um, you know, it would definitely assist the sheriff's department in being able to readily and quickly deploy and address that, not just with that, uh, but with uh, all the other resources that go with it, uh, stolen vehicles, armed and dangerous. I also want to acknowledge the... Uh, various organizations in the community like the HOAs that have invested heavily uh, in this technology to protect their residents. And I hope that in the five-year uh, agreement um, that perhaps the city can look at areas that do not have HOAs, but perhaps would be interested in maybe establishing a public safety district to fund HOAs if you had groups of people or residents who were willing to do it on public roadways, uh, perhaps that were outside of the initial plan of your strategic deployment uh, based off of the other considerations. So. You, know, you raised some good points. Um, we are looking at other technology opportunities that we see other cities have deployed. And yes, Beverly Hills was the reverse, but I, and I highlighted it for that specific reason. And so there are other opportunities we're going to look to. Um, the cameras are not only good for identifying those vehicles that do come in. We have a number of cases through the sheriff's office where the data that came off those cameras led to investigations or assisted in investigations that led to the capture of individuals that were causing a number of different problems. I know early on there were a lot of thefts in the Via Verde area from mailboxes. And so it, uh, the flock system led to the capture of individuals that were not only doing thefts, in San Dimas, but they were doing thefts in other communities. And so we also have to look at the investigative potential of that technology. Thank you. And, and as we, just, we might, might add that the capture of our bad guy led to the capture of Los Angeles City, where they had three murders that they were, had no you know, bases on. And our suspect ended up being arrested for those murders. So it's, uh, I think the entire region recognizes the, the use of these. And, and uh, those folks who might have been a little skeptical, uh, I've heard from many of them who've called me and said, hey, I got, I got an eye awakening, and I'm glad you guys did it. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to work at it. And, and like uh, the city manager says, there's other technology that has come along that since we put the flocks up have now give us a little bit better idea of technology and we're reaching out to other communities that are using things we just hearing about. And uh, I think that's a, a good thing. And, and uh, I, I just want to send our respects to the family who lost their, their father and their husband uh, once again. And uh, the city of San Dimas is uh, here and willing to help wherever we can with that, you know, those, that family. All right. Uh, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm in agreement with what everybody said here. The flaw cameras are uh, the foremost reason why we're able to take a murderous serial killer off the streets and prevent more crime from happening. The, um, the value right now is unquestioned. Uh, I am in support of Flock, and I'm in support of growing the number of cameras, uh, especially in areas where uh, there isn't current surveillance that could continue to help solve crime and to 
uh, find and capture those who are committing crimes both large and small. The concern I do have, however, is that I was surprised to see that without the locking in of the special arrangement, the price would have increased 20%. Uh, which is a pretty big jump. That's about three to five times the rate of inflation, depending on when you measure it. And I just wanted to know, is this 20% typical every year of an increase, or is this once every five years? Because I think the, the major concern I have is if we do decide to grow the program and then each camera increases 20% a year, you can quickly see the danger that the city would be in uh, if you know, if that were to happen and in the, in the increases in, for the same amount of service, I understand it's not like we're buying additional packages, same amount of service every year increasing faster than inflation will put the city's finances at risk. Can you provide Yeah, I, I, so far they have not done any, this is the first increase we've had in the programs uh, since the beginning. They appear to be more periodic than-, than Yeah, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem to be a pattern of every year increases. Okay. It's been several years since we first started with the program and before that it was the same pricing, so. I think they're just trying to catch up with the, the rising okay. costs that they're experiencing. It's heartening to know. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, there's nothing else. I'll move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries 5-0. And we'll move off of the consent calendar that's normally a two-minute item. <laughs> but I think questions were very good. and I. Thank uh, the council for pulling them. Okay, we'll move on to uh, other business. Uh, Louis Tarico, the community development director, will uh, uh, talk about the draft downtown specific plan. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, Louis Tarico, Interim Director of Community Development. Uh, tonight, we're presenting to you the first draft of the downtown specific plan. Staff and the consulting team have been working on this document for approximately 12 years, 12 years, two years. Um, this is the third version of a document, so it does date back to 12 years. So. <laughs> um, the version you have before you tonight is the efforts of the staff and the consulting team and also the public's inputs through various community meetings. Uh, this is a major undertaking as it will assist in reimagining imagining the city's downtown by creating a development plan for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so it's a very important document um, and a lot of uh, time and effort has gone into this. Um, tonight, we are asking for feedback and input. There is no formal action required tonight. Um, so we're just seeking to get uh, feedback and input on the document um, in regards to, and then we'll move on to next steps. Um, I'll introduce Ann Moore, a senior planner, who will give you a little more information on the process and how we got here, and we'll subsequently introduce the consulting team, which will present a presentation and provide a little more information on the document itself. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, Ann Moore, a senior planner. Um, it's great to see everyone this evening. And uh, as um, Lewis had set, stated, this has been a, a two-year process. And just want to reiterate that there have been a total of four out of five community workshops that have been held over the two-year time span. Um, and additionally, we have also held four um, meetings with our community advisory committee um, during that time frame as well. The last community workshop was actually held um, earlier this year in March 29th, 2023. Um, staff and the consultants since that time, we've continued to work diligently on the downtown specific plan. Um, although a draft um, environmental impact report document is not available right now, we do have the draft downtown specific plan, which is what we will present, present to you um, this evening. Um, the current draft was actually presented to the planning commission at their November 16th, um, 2023 meeting. So just a few weeks ago. And at that meeting, we also gathered their input. Um, a number of items that were shared by the Planning Commission is included in the staff report for this evening. And um, at this time, again, we will be presenting to Council for your feedback and input as well. Just to reiterate, following 
input received this evening. Um, staff will finalize the document and work with the consultants um, regarding all of the feedback provided by both the commissioners and the city council. And we will hold a fifth and final community workshop meeting early next year. Um, date still yet to be determined. The fifth community workshop meeting will give the public the ability to review the final draft prior to um, city staff presenting the downtown specific plan to the planning commission and city council um, next year uh, during public hearings for uh, final adoption. So again, just to reiterate, um, there will be more opportunity for discussion. Um, at this time, we wanna provide the opportunity for the council as a, the first draft um, to get your feedback. Without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce um, our consultant team from InterWest, um, project manager Nick Pergakis, as well as senior planner um, Jennifer Williams. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, we're gonna give a brief presentation of the draft specific plan, uh, probably about 15 minutes or so, just to give you an overview of the document and the key items in the plan, and uh, then we'll turn it back over to you for your input and comments. So we'll move to the next slide. So we'll uh, provide uh, an overview of the specific plan goals and purpose of the plan, timeline of the specific plan process, uh, give you an overview of the document and how it's laid out with the different chapters, uh, discuss and show you a few slides on the opportunity sites in the city that we've looked at and then talk about next steps, and then on to questions and answers. So the specific plan provides a vision for the downtown of San Dimas over the next uh, 20 years, and it creates a lively destination uh, for the city to support the current and future economic base. Uh, we're looking to capitalize on the new transit station that opens up in a few years uh, here in San Dimas. And then we're also trying to create an in-town and regional destination for San Dimas. It also establishes new zoning regulations for the downtown area, including uh, permitted uses, building form, addresses massing of buildings, heights, setbacks, site design, et cetera. And we also uh, address uh, design standards to help ensure that there's high quality uh, development in the downtown area in terms of architecture, uh, landscape architecture and design, as well as site uh, and building design. We're also uh, trying to create a safe environment for people to travel, to walk, and to drive in the city, in the downtown area, and ensuring streets are safe and user-friendly for all modes of travel. Here is a timeline of the specific plan. Uh, we think we've shown this in some previous meetings where uh, we have five phases of the plan. We had the beginning of the plan back in fall of 2021, where we uh, looked at existing documents, uh, reports and policies, identifying key issues and opportunities in the downtown area. That's when we had our first uh, public meeting. At the time, it was actually during COVID, so that was a um, online community meeting at the time, but then we moved on to our next phase of work, the listening and visiting visioning stage, where we were looking at the what could, could be in the downtown area, what it, what would it look like in 20 years, uh, providing a vision and guiding principles and had more community meetings throughout uh, 2022, the early part of 2022. And then we worked on developing some plan alternatives um, to develop the land use plan, mobility alternatives for the downtown area through the middle part of 2022, and then started working on the specific plan document and the policies, uh, development standards and design standards throughout the remaining part of 2022 and into uh, earlier part of this year, and also uh, having more community workshops and getting community input along the way uh, from residents as well as through the community advisory committee. And then uh, we're now in that last box, the adoption of the specific plan where we're having public and decision makers reviewing the specific plan document to give us a feedback and comments, and then also um, looking towards adopting the specific plan in the early part of uh, 2024. So now I'll turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the document. Thank you. Um, this slide's just gonna give like a, a quick list overview of the chapters. We're gonna get into the content um, in each chapter on the following slide. So I'm gonna go over the first kind of half of the specific plan document. 
So um, chapter one um, includes basically the introduction. Uh, it talks about how the specific plan uh, relates to the general plan and to state law, what the purpose of the document is. Um, it also gives an overview of the public participation we've had to date. So again, starting this project, uh, we, we utilized some online resources with the pandemic. Um, we had a mind mixer website, which allowed for public comments and participation in kind of an interactive format. We also had our first community meeting virtually on Zoom um, and had breakout rooms. We were able to get individual um, kind of uh, discussion and feedback at the end of that meeting. We followed up with um, in-person um, public workshops in May and August of 2022 and in March of 2023. And as was mentioned, we had a technical advisory meeting and a um, community advisory meeting as well. Um, and then we brought it to the Planning Commission again uh, in November of 23 for their comments on the draft, which were included in the staff report. Uh, chapter two um, includes the vision, the downtown framework, and the strategies for uh, achieving the vision and the goals. Um, I'm not gonna read through the text on all of these slides, but I will take the time to just read the, the vision statement because we feel like that's really the guiding um, kind of principles for this document. Um, and this is based on feedback received from the community uh, through the public uh, meeting process. But um, essentially the vision would be downtown is the heart of the city of San Dimas, a walkable and vibrant activity center which celebrates and preserves its human scale character for people of all ages and provides a diversity of retail, restaurant, cultural and civic uses, a variety of housing options and creates local employment opportunities which breathe life and activity into the historic commercial center of the city. Um, and also in that chapter, our goals that were formulated again with input from the community, from the community advisory committee, uh, feedback from staff, uh, a very much a collaborative community process. And then um, chapters three, four, and five really are um, kind of a lot of the, basically contain a lot of the um, regulations and um, kind of technical portions of the document. So chapter three deals with um, zoning and land use. Uh, the specific plan area establishes um, six different zones within the plan area. Um, and each zone is intended to have its own unique character, allowable land uses and development standards to kind of recognize the diversity. I mean, we're talking about a over 200 acre um, uh, plan area and uh, a very linear um, plan area based on, you know, going across Bonita from the 57 freeway almost to uh, the eastern end, almost to Gaffney there. Um, the uh, Basically also wanted to mention the plan area does envision sort of an extended downtown. I know when we were uh, at the community meetings, we heard a lot of feedback on the historic town core and the core area, which you might think of maybe between say, Eucla and San Dimas Avenue or Walnut. And um, the plan area boundaries were something we talked about earlier in the process, basically trying to um, address a number of the housing um, element opportunity sites. Um, and you can see uh, in addition to the six zones, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next slides, there's also an overlay zone put on the, um, on the map, which identifies housing element sites. Um, and that would help to basically implement the current housing element, which was recently adopted and establish minimum densities to comply with the housing element. Uh, and now I'll just kind of give an overview of each of those zones. So in red on the map is the Gateway Village West Zone. Um, this is one of the prime redevelopment opportunity sites um, given the uh, housing element designations as well as just the parcel sizes and land area that's dedicated to Gateway Village West. Uh, we saw this as an opportunity to um, bring new activity and vibrancy into the downtown and to establish an entertainment, retail, and restaurant sort of core. Um, this is also the area where height and density are concentrated the most for new development and redevelopment of the sites. Um, with that also, there are some natural barriers with industrial to the south and the rail corridor to the north that kind of helped and the freeway to the west that kind of helped to um, kind of minimize impacts to, um, to residential areas, single family homes. Um, I should have mentioned previously before I got into the different zones too, the, the site area specifically 
uh, for the entire plan area was uh, chosen to focus on industrial, commercial, retail type um, land uses. So it specifically excluded what you might think of as the downtown in terms of the single family neighborhoods, basically as a reflection to try to protect and preserve the character of those neighborhoods and to concentrate new development, new housing into, into these com more commercial um, type areas. Um, next, uh, and I'm kind of going through these zones from most intense to least intense. So um, the transit village area is shown in purple on the map here, and that's basically centered around the new um, uh, uh, light rail station. Um, it's uh, basically a special zone for station adjacent, adjacent parcels and blocks. We um, really want to um, kind of uh, build upon the success of the existing Grove Station project there, and um, new projects would be in, encouraged to have similar uh, site design and building design and architectural characteristics. Um, the uses listed are similar to those permitted in Gateway Village West, but there's a high priority on pedestrian-oriented design and um, human scale. Gateway Village East is on the Eastern end of the city is shown in orange, or I'm sorry, of the plan area is shown in orange here. This is definitely a transitional zone um, from downtown to the sensitive existing established single family neighborhoods. Um, this, uh, the setbacks and development standards are a little bit different as well as the land uses. This is the only zone uh, that allows for commercial that would also allow for 100% residential projects. The other zones would require a mixed use component if adjacent to San Dimas Avenue or Bonita Avenue. And then the town core is what many will think of as the traditional historic downtown segment of the specific plan area. Uh, this is shown on, as golden on the map. Um, new development and redevelopment projects within the town core would be required to retain and reflect the historic feel and scale of the buildings. This uh, zone would also have the lowest density and the lowest building heights of two to three stories with the third story being required to be set, stepped back from the second floor. Um, and this zone would also require ground floor pedestrian oriented uses on street frontages on Bonita and San Dimas Avenue, but there could still be um, housing or other uses behind those uh, retail or commercial uses on Bonita and San Dimas. Then in blue, you'll see the public semi-public zone. Um, and this would be examples like the uh, city hall, the senior center, the library, the fire station, the sheriff station, uh, post office, those civic oriented uses. Um, it would allow for basically those necessary um, and beneficial uh, public uses and also allow for joint use um, opportunities. And then lastly, um, the open space zone would allow for open space and preservation of natural resources, um, things like active or passive parks. Um, I will mention, uh, so you'll see like Civic Center Park, um, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Heroes Monument. Um, All of the existing parks are preserved in the open space zone that exists right now. Um, you'll, you might notice too that there are no new open space zones designated outside of the existing park parkland. However, there are requirements in the open space standards for development to include open space and in some cases publicly accessible open space incorporated into the development itself. So um, chapter three again basically describes those six different zones and also contains a land use table. We just took a, a screenshot of a section of this just to show an example and there's a legend in there to kind of explain what would be permitted uses, what would be conditionally permitted uses. There's also a new minor use permit process um, created in the plan. And then in chapter four, we get into the development standards which would basically set um, site planning um, architectural and building uh, standards. It would control density, number of stories and building heights, building mass and floor area ratio, setbacks and stepbacks and um, parking, open space, all of those are included in, in chapter four in the development standards. Um, here's also a, just a, a snapshot of a section of that table kind of outlining some of the uh, standards that are included in chapter four. And then I'll hand it over to, back to Nick for 
chapter five. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, we had a little uh, sample too. We just wanted to show an example of the building step back. So this would be um, a three-story building, and you can see in the picture that's in downtown in South Pasadena. Um, but you can see how incorporating things like building setbacks for upper floors can really help to reduce the mass and the scale and make a more comfortable pedestrian environment that perhaps feels more uh, appropriate for San Dimas, but still getting that additional height and number of stories to allow development to occur. Thank you. So ch chapter five includes design standards and guidelines for new buildings or the adaptive reuse of existing buildings in the downtown area. Um, we also have design standards that are mandatory requirements that must be satisfied in the project design. So that includes objective design standards, which are now required uh, by state law for eligible housing uh, in, in areas that include affordable housing and, and housing that uh, would require streamlining. And then we have design guidelines. Uh, so that's things that we are encouraging in the city to, to be included in the new design of buildings or uh, structures, and that would include um, design objectives the city wants to see. Next slide. For mobility, um, in our community meetings, we heard from residents there is an interest in making the downtown more pedestrian friendly and uh, to encourage more activities such as outdoor dining, but also want to address uh, automobile traffic with new development and foot traffic to the station. So we want to make it easier for people to access transit without the need of a car and provide better connectivity in the downtown area. The following uh, recommendations and strategies provide direction for future decision-making and development activities in the specific plan area. Uh, these strategies were developed from input received from community members and stakeholders and city staff throughout our community engagement. And they are encouraged and intended to be consistent with existing local and regional plans and initiatives. So uh, strategy one is designing a network of complete streets that facilitate safe and comfortable uh, connections between destinations in the downtown area while maintaining the small town character of downtown, improving connectivity to transit uh, through the provision of high quality bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, as well as streetscape improvements and signage. This strategy three includes bicycle and pedestrian networks designed to be connected and prioritizing the safety of all users uh, strategy four is uh, including parking management strategies to help encourage uh, the efficient use and sharing of parking resources to support initiatives that can reduce parking demand needs over time. And then the fifth strategy is supporting uh, transit-oriented uh, development and land uses in the specific plan area. Chapter seven uh, is infrastructure and that is looking at existing conditions of infrastructure in the specific plan area and then with proposed improvements to serve the downtown specific plan area uh, we address sewer capacity and water storm drain systems electrical services uh, natural gas as well as uh, dry utilities such as telecommunications and cable and then chapter eight is the administration of the specific plan so that shows how um, proposed land uses will be reviewed and uh, looked at by city staff and going through the planning process. And we also have uh, some efficient entitlement processing guidance for future development of the specific plan area. And then also a streamlined review uh, provisions of multi-unit mixed-use residential projects under the new state laws, such as SB 330 and SB 35. Chapter nine is uh, the implementation of the specific plan. So how can we take the vision and uh, the things we wanna see happen over the next 15 to 20 years and how we can implement it over time uh, with area specific fees, dedications and exactions that the city can consider uh, over the next 20 years. Also looking at specific districts or special districts that could be uh, incorporated in the specific plan such as a special assessment districts or a business improvement district. Uh, to help fund uh, some of these new um, you know, things we're looking at in terms of streetscape improvements or uh, other improvements in, this, in the area. We also include federal and state grants that the city can consider and look at for uh, funding opportunities. And then also uh, looking at implementation and phasing of the plan uh, 
and we look at it in the kind of the short term up to about five years, kind of we give a list of things that we should look at for implementation and then uh, kind of more of the longer term between five and 15 years of implementation uh, items and phasing to occur. We also uh, looked at opportunity sites in the specific plan area in San Dimas Station North and South. So in the last community meet, uh, workshop back in March, uh, we showed some of the renderings and drawings for that area uh, of what could occur. Um, these are also sites that were identified as housing element opportunity sites in the, in the housing element. So we had concept illustrations showing a vision for what could what this area could look like with pedestrian amenities, uh, you know, how the buildings would look, fronting the streets, um, and then how the new development could be built and phased over many years. So this, you know, with this next, next site plan kind of shows the, the two um, sites in the housing element, just kind of a, a future kind of look at what those sites could look like if they redeveloped uh, cohesively and holistically together, um, you know, likely, this is just a vision. So we're just kind of showing what, what could happen there with new buildings, uh, with residential, um, you know, commercial buildings, uh, public spaces. You see quite a bit of kind of pedestrian and public spaces there in, in between the buildings, including landscaping and park space. Um, and then just identifies uses such as a hotel and some other buildings uh, there and giving a snapshot of what that could look like in the future. Here's a rendering of Arrow Highway uh, looking northwest. So looking at some, in, with the design standards, development standards, we include in the plan what this area could look like. Um, and then for next steps, as uh, Ann had mentioned, we are preparing the CEQA document uh, in tandem with a specific plan. So that would be ready for public review in early 2024. Again, we'll have another community workshop, the fifth and final workshop in early 2024 to get feedback from the public on the draft plan, and then also uh, looking towards adoption uh, later in the year. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you. Uh, questions, John? Actually, Mr. Mayor, because I know what's about to happen, I think, uh, looking at the copious notes John has. has um, I'm just gonna fall on a sword and say, 800 pages was a lot in this packet. So it is my intent to ask to continue this item to the, at least the second meeting uh, in January to be able to provide more comprehensive feedback um, because I think there's a lot in here and we've spent two years doing it. And admittedly, I am not in a position to be able to give all the feedback based off of some of the things that I've noted. So uh, that's where I'm going with it. I don't know if that changes anything, uh, but um, for any of my colleagues, but that's my. Hope. And, and uh, just a real quick question. This is like uh, Ryan just said, this thing is 798 pages, give or take. Uh, the reality is, there are there copies of the, this this report available for the public to come in and view and uh, come up with questions or anything they want? Uh, I uh, just, I hear some heads out there saying, holy Christ, you know. Uh, so the question is, is, are we going to make copies available to, for them to come in and view or something like that? So currently the document is available on the city's website. It is, um, because I'm hearing it's not. It, it is, it's on the city's, so we have a dedicated webpage um, for the downtown specific plan. And it was actually uploaded uh, to that page when we went before the planning commission November 16th. Okay. And it's been in that page since then. Uh, we also have hard copies that we can make available at the counter for review. Super. All right. The only thing I'll say is that uh, maybe, it, so maybe I don't, won't, don't want to get into such detail, but I think maybe there's some foundational questions I could ask that, that are, um, and one of which isn't really spelled out in the plan, which is long. And so I may have missed it. So that's 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 kind of kind of it. Um, so let me just ask a couple questions. And I did talk with staff um, three times over the past week about some of these things, and then today emailed them a list of what I would be talking about, asking them about. So um, they, they were prepared for it. But um, I guess just one of the a couple main questions then. 
that um, Ann or Lewis or one of the consultants can, can uh, talk about. In the staff report, um, it, you know, we're talking about the zoning density. And I was just, you know, we have the RENA number, which are required to meet, 1248. Um, there are uh, a, a number of opportunity sites in the housing element. Um, all but three are in the downtown specific plan. So that 1248 is designed, what the housing element is, is, is designed such that it would satisfy that 1248 using the opportunity zones in the downtown specific plan plus three other opportunity sites that are nearby but not included. In addition, there are other sites uh, based on the zoning that would have housing on it in the, um, in the downtown specific plan. So um, I, I've asked this a couple times of staff and they provided me the number every time and I keep forgetting it so I wrote it down, but, but I'll ask if this, based on the zoning that is anticipated in this plan for all of the areas, how many housing units would be allowed under the proposed zoning in the downtown specific plan? Um, that's a good question. So based on all the, the sites in the downtown specific plan, the different densities for each district, if this plan was to be built out at full capacity, which is very unlikely, but at full capacity, it'd be 3,687 units. And we do that analysis because as part of the environmental document that we're working on, we have to look at worst case scenario. So we have to um, prepare for that and plan for that in the event that it does happen. Um, it's very unlikely that it'll get built out to that capacity, um, but we do have to look at it, the potential that it does. And one thing to note as well, so this is a 10 to 20 year document. So um, could it be built out to capacity? Potentially. It's also important to note that this document would cover uh, up to two or three housing element cycles. So currently we have arena of 1248 um, and it tripled from the last one. So it's more likely it'll probably at least double at this next one. So that 36 number could potentially cover both um, cycles from upcoming housing elements. But, but we do uh, look at those numbers because we have to plan for it in, as part of the environmental analysis. And I understand that. My comment on that uh, briefly, because I have a few different comments about it and questions, but my comment is that you know, when we decide what the city is going to look like um, in our, our humble opinion and we take community input, the input that we often get is that they, people like it, uh, the, kind of the low density way that it is. Understanding that we need to provide for more housing units because we have to, um, there's probably still a sweet spot that would allow for the headroom you talk about. So for example, 1,800 units would be almost 50% more than what we're being required um, in this cycle. Uh, and remember, this isn't including the three other sites that aren't even in the downtown specific plan. Um, and, but there may be some number that is a better number to show this council's vision for what San Dimas should look like 20 years from now. And it's actually, say, 15 years from now, you say, well, we're not quite doing it. Um, the sites that are in play, if they haven't been developed yet, we could always boost the density, some, something to what you're suggesting to do right now. Secondly, there are other sites, like on the south side of Arrow Highway, which are, could be opportunity sites in a future housing element. So all of that are, is to say that um, that number is a th thing to think about, the 3,687, which of course is around 7,000 residents. And I'm not sure if we are prepared, and maybe the community is prepared for, for 7,000 new residents in the Bonita Corridor. So that's that uh, comment and question about that. Um, I did want to say, I mean, before I say anything else is that I think this plan is turning out really great. And, you know, I, I can't even, as I was going through it, I was checking this, checking that, is all, all these great things, the vision statement, the uh, way that the, the uh, human scale and the mobility and on and on and on, everything's um, handled, the graphics, the pictures, the maps. I, I think it's a, it's a great document, and I really want to congratulate staff and the consultant and the community for coming out, and also the council for 
really committing to it this time, because this is really about the third go-round in the last 20 years we've tried to do this thing. Um, let me see if I can just find a couple um, other, not comments, but questions. Because um, I don't want to, let me just look, go through my document here. I did have one question. Let's see. This was about, this was, if anybody's following along, it's on page 43 of the plan. I don't have the agenda packet number, but page 43 of the plan. And it's the land use table, section 3.4.3. .3. And there's a line in there about transitional and supportive housing. And this is for, I, I, I was wondering if you could explain that. And, and tell us whether transitional housing is required by the state. Yes, so transitional and supportive housing is required by the state to be allowed by right in any zone that allows residential uses. Um, that's actually one of the things that we were required to update as part of our housing element. So we are actually working uh, as one of the programs, working on some amendments to bring before the commission and subsequently the council to make sure that our code is in compliance with the state law. But to answer the question, uh, transitional and supportive housing is a use that's allowed by right in all residential zones. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. And let's see, anything else on the question front? Um, I guess maybe one thing that is kind of important is um, just to understand the ground floor height of, of the buildings that are fronting along like San Dimas Avenue and um, Bonita that are designed for, I, I think, for commercial. And there's a number 14 feet in a couple places in the, in the plan. So first of all, the definition of the 14 feet, I saw it in one area where it's from the sidewalk to the second floor um, or the roof if there's only a one-story building. And I'm trying to think of what that would do to the interior height. Because it seems that commercial space needs to have a certain height to be welcoming to commercial. Um, my first question is, is 14 a standard that, we, that is a, uh, you know, amenable to and encouraging to first floor businesses? And the second is, shouldn't that be measured from just floor to ceiling? In, within the unit as opposed to some exterior measurement. Page 62 has a... Um, um, Thank you. I'm sorry. Page 62 is a uh, under frontages in Chapter 4, 4.3.2. Yeah. So the... the I can jump in. Uh, the 14 foot uh, minimum is across all of the Gateway Village West, Transit Village, Gateway Villages, and Town Core. Um, and it's uh, 10 feet actually for residential minimum. And then if it's not on a street frontage and then 14 feet for uh, non-residential. Um, we did look at several other cities and specific plans and that seemed to be actually a pretty a generous and fair uh, number that would allow uh, those commercial uses to successfully operate and that's sort of a standard. We also um, maybe want to talk about Kurt's involvement a little bit and sure. Arcadis. Yeah, so we, um, you know, through our experience developing specific plans and looking at, um, you know, the commercial spaces of mixed-use buildings, you know, typically you want, you know, pretty high ceiling for that first floor. And then usually we go up to sometimes 20 feet, 18, 20 feet at the most for that first floor. But um, yeah, usually that's, that's kind of a minimum standard we like to use is about 14 feet and the maximum about, you know, 18 to 18, 20 feet. Okay. So. Good, good to know. I, I didn't know that. And uh, I was going to take my me tape measure and go to some of the downtown spaces and elsewhere, but I didn't have time to do that, but may still do that. But, um, you know, 16 may be a better number than 14 is what I'm thinking. Just because when I walk into a restaurant or something else, mm -hmm. you know, um, just seems like the ceilings are, are up there a little bit, but I, yeah, sometimes you have exposed like air, duct, you know, you may have that, you may have other things like that. So, okay. Thanks for that. How tall are you, John? Uh, I'm a uh, full disclosure. I am five, four. 
Thank you. <laughs> Although I think I used to be 5'5". Five, five. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> well, the ceiling's a long way away. Yeah, was, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I won't be able to touch it. Uh, let me see here. Oh, um, I was just noticing, uh, so this is under mobility. I'm almost actually there, you guys, for, for tonight, I guess. Um, this is under the mobility, under um, those pictures with the, the lane configurations, specifically looking at bikes, bicycle lanes, I think. And 6.3.5 on, that's a figure on page 117. There's a couple pictures there, actually. And I noticed, this is San Dimas Avenue going southbound from Bonita. And I noticed there's, there's bike indications on all the other lanes and places, but here there isn't a bike indication going south, southbound, so it's on the left of the picture. And I was wondering if those should be Sharrows there. Just something to maybe, <coughs> I don't know if that was missed or, or what, but it seems that that's an area. And then, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, the, the only other, the last thing then would be that, um, and this is by way of comment, I'm sorry to jump ahead, Ryan, uh, and others who may not have um, gotten to it, but um, Gateway Village West is the part that's um, west of Cataract in the map. And uh, we don't necessarily bring the map, have to bring it up for a full discussion right now. But it seems that the pictures that Nikki sh showed, or Jennifer, about the renditions of what could go um, west of Eucla, that kind of development, and the standards are the same. Oh, the picture's good right there. You see Eucla is kind of on left, the, the last street that goes through on the left and kind of curves down at the bottom. So things to the west or the left of that are that one kind, especially in the, it's bounded by Arrow Highway and then Bonita on the, on the top, and then Sienega and 57 Freeway. Um, that is really intense development, it seems like. And there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that's really intense. When you go along Bonita eastward to Cataract, so the area from Eucla to Cataract, I don't imagine that being the same kind of development. In fact, I imagine that to be a little bit more like what's along Bonita Avenue east of Cataract, the lower, lower. so um, whereas we have four stories in the, um, in the, the western part of that, um, and everything from setbacks and streetscape and lanes and everything else is, could be the same as what's in that very intense development so I was wondering if we might want to break that off either to sub area 1A and B or something like that, or to just make it its own area. Um, my preferred name for that is Downtown West, as I've mentioned to Ann a couple times. But uh, whatever it would be called, I, I think it would be more in keeping with the lower profile. Uh, and, and it's also closer to neighborhoods and all that kind of stuff. So it just seems that that would be a, a better transition and a, a, a lower uh, intensity along Benita, that, those two blocks right there. So that's the only, uh, I'll make, I have all specific numbers and stuff like that that I can make at another time, but that's just, I just want to let you know that that's coming. Thank you, John. Let me so, uh, ask this question uh, of, the, of the council. I don't know how many questions you're gonna have at this point in time, but I think at this time we're gonna take a five minute break, which always means 10, but, uh, the reality is we'll take a break right now and then we'll come back to you. Any future, further questions that you guys have? We're in recess. <laughs>
the uh, city council meeting. Uh, questions? I, uh, I have one quick question that's kind of wrapped up in uh, just kind of my thoughts on the, the report. Thank you so much for all of the work that went into this. Uh, it is extremely, like my colleagues have said, it is extremely voluminous and uh, it, there really is a lot of good stuff in there. Um, a couple of things that I want to highlight um, is that the setbacks to me for potential developments like this at first glance look fairly decent. Um, I think where communities around us have gone wrong in some of these uh, um, type of developments is uh, going very, very lean on setbacks, which has uh, created a situation where the buildings just absolutely do not uh, fit in any way, shape, or form in the, uh, in the public space. So uh, I was pretty happy with those. Uh, I will always have major concerns, and I will continue to have concerns, uh, about limiting the height of developments in the city. Um, I work in a city that has dozens of these um, just large, dense vertical developments that are going in um, in, uh, in Orange County. And they're beautiful buildings, great architecture, fantastic amenities. Um, but no matter what, looking at those buildings and seeing them every day and walking around in them, nothing like that will ever fit into our city. Um, but just to highlight that between the setbacks and the, the height of these buildings, I think, is where we need to tread very carefully because it, it's where we can lose the character of the city. Um, so the question being, uh, as I was looking at the, the report, um, I wonder if we did consider or if we didn't consider why we didn't um, tiering the third to fourth stories, uh, the setback fourth stories, like we did in some other areas where we tiered second to third. Um, in like in the downtown core, we're tearing the second stories, uh, or tearing the third stories back uh, past the, the setback of the second. If we're talking about larger b developments, uh, higher than, than, you know, three or four stories, uh, I think it would be really important to incorporate those type of uh, uh, elements in, in even larger developments as well. Sorry, just fact-checking so, real quick. Go ahead. So um, just to make sure I understand the question, you, you'd like to see step-backs for the upper levels for the floors? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it, just, because, it, just because it's outside of the downtown core, it, for sure in the downtown core, I, I agree that between the second and third stories, that they need to be set back a little bit. I think that would really... Uh, help those uh, developments blend in a little bit into the, the downtown core. But just like uh, a three-story building wouldn't quite fit in the downtown core, I don't think that a four- or even five-story building would ever fit anywhere else in the city for that matter. So I think those elements would be important to carry over to, to potential larger developments in other areas. Yeah, so currently we do have those in place. So in, we, have, we require step-backs in all the districts. Um, the third floor... Uh, is required to be stepped back 12 feet from the second, and the fourth floor, where allowed, is also required to be stepped back 12 feet from the third floor. So we have those in place for all the districts. Um, um, so we already have that. That's actually on page uh, 57 of the document or page 597 of your agenda packet. Okay. Uh, just to, to point out, too, to add on to that, so on page 57, the, that has required minimum street step backs, and that's for a minimum of 70% of the building frontage, uh, for Benita Avenue and San Dimas Avenue. So um, on Benita and San Dimas, throughout every district, um, well, town core, fourth floor is not allowed. So, but in the other uh, districts, uh, the second or the third floor and the fourth floor both required to be stepped back on Benita Avenue and San Dimas Avenue. And then the table uh, 4.3-3 on page 58 sets... Um, street step backs for buildings adjacent to other street frontages. Um, and so in Gateway Village uh, East, again, the third floor is required. And in Gateway Village West and Transit Village, uh, and I'm sorry, third floor in all zones is required to be stepped back. Um, fourth floor is not currently in, uh, required in Gateway Village West and Transit Village, if not on Benita or San Dimas Avenue. But that is you know, something that we could receive input on and consider changes to. We were trying to um, allow for more uh, flexibility for uh, 
feasibility of development while also trying to protect Bonita and San Dimas Avenue. So that's how those numbers were arrived at, but um, we're open to your feedback on that. Okay. Eric, are you talking about the, the street, what, what's seen from street or adjacent residential? Yeah, you know, I or, think- or, or including interior, because I think you're, Jennifer, you might've said that interior to the project, like facing each other, they don't require that, that tiering. To, um, to other like residential uses, we do ask for step backs in the back or show step backs, but it's mostly for the fronts, okay. for fronting the streets. I, I do agree. I, th I think that's really good to incorporate that when it when it does abut other residentials uh, to to step it back like that. Um, and it's uh, it's really reassuring that uh, that we are including it for uh, other areas. I would absolutely like to, to maybe talk about how we could potentially uh, integrate step backs for third to fourth stories maybe in, uh, in other areas. I think um, that's going to be a major concern for not just me, but for probably a, a lot of the, uh, the community. Uh, but as other people probably know about me, uh, you know, I don't think there's any good reason for, for there to be a building over three stories tall in our city. Um, it's kind of sad that we have to discuss this, but we do. Um, and I know it's probably a pipe dream to, to even think that we would be at a place where we could just say, you know, a blanket three stories is the max for San Dimas. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the reality is that we're not built like Pasadena and our community resoundingly doesn't want to become Pasadena. Um, and the more and more I look at these projects uh, and the more I'm around them uh, in my place of work, it's uh, it's kind of kind of disheartening because um, that's just the way that we're being forced to go. And uh, I think any impacts that we can, we can uh, mitigate on the front end here in the downtown specific plan can uh, absolutely, as John said, uh, change the way the city looks and feels 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So, um, you know, I just have a hard time as a part of the report looking at, you know, the uh, 55 foot tall uh, development with you know additional eight feet for a, a gabled roof uh, as a as a benefit. Looking at a 63 foot tall building in our city, um, um, but I, I would be as John mentioned in favor of of looking at breaking out the um, northern portion of the housing element overlay in Gateway Village West, and maybe looking at making that a little bit shorter to uh, to help mitigate the the uh, verticality of that particular part of the project. Yeah, it's actually, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we wanted to touch on that uh, just briefly. Um, so there is a reason behind uh, the way these, the district was laid out. So um, one, more importantly, um, those three parcels there, the density is driven by the housing element. Um, so it's uh, density that's already been designated as part of the housing element, so that's why we uh, um, have those numbers there. And then also in discussions with through the various community meetings, um, the bridge itself act as a physical barrier. And so that's why we thought it was a natural transition, but it's something that we can look at, um, but we'll be very limited in regards to the density because of the housing element sites. But I think when we come back to this, it would be good to, for that particular stretch and the housing element sites you're talking about, see those calculations. Cause I don't, I didn't see the, underlying calculations for that. And there may be ways of achieving density on the site. Let's take the bowling alley property, for example, where you, kind of like Eric was saying, you have something at the front of the property that makes it look like a smaller downtownish, whatever you want to call it, and the back has, has more density, something like that. And the other thing is that, um, the other thing is, never mind, forget, forgot right now. But, but couldn't we... Couldn't we add additional properties to the housing element and change that number? That, that's the way I understood it. That we, although we've identified 16 locations or properties, it, we could add additional ones and delete, you know, additional property, not properties, but you know, residents on that buildings. Right? Is that the way I understand it? That that is correct. That's something that that any city can do and more likely um, 
majority of cities, including ourselves, will more likely ultimately have to do that as housing element sites don't develop to the full capacity as identified in the housing element. The only concern with that is when we open up the housing element, we risk the state um, trying to implement, uh, having us implement additional uh, programs or requirements that um, are not already in there. But to answer your question, yes, we can reallocate um, sites. Okay. And I get just one one question on on the three and the four story element. We for this from the second to the third floor story, it's a twelve foot setback. My question is, if you have a twelve foot setback, does the third floor have the ability to use that twelve foot as a patio type situation? You know, like they have those glass, you know. So they, you're giving them space there, and then and do we have any control of that at all? You know, I'm not saying that we would, but what if we didn't want them to use that element to be looking over the city or whatever? I know I'm just, I don't know why we wouldn't, but it, are we just giving them an additional, uh, f you know, footage? Yeah, as currently written, it would allow. Uh, those to be used as decks for open space, whether private or common open space. But if there's concerns, we can certainly look into either requiring them to be pushed back. I know some cities that do allow roof decks have a minimum requirement of like between five and 10 feet pushed back from the edge of the structure before the open space begins. So Yeah, I, I might see, you know, uh, a restaurant or something like wanted to have outside seating. Uh, and kind of what uh, Pioneer Square talked about originally with rooftop dining and, and stuff, something that went by the wayside after a while. But uh, I'll give you the perfect example of when you wouldn't want that outside space to be used as a patio, and that's when that tiered, uh, tiered setback abuts a residential property and somebody would just be looking down into somebody's backyard. Yeah. That would probably be the use case that I could think of where... That might not be something we've, that we're desirous we, of. We've had a couple of those problems with, with just housing, you know, backing up to somebody else's backyard and swimming pool and things like that. Okay, Mr. Nakano, you got something you'd like to add to this conversation? I had a few questions, but I'll save the, the most of them for when we continue our session since they tend to be more specific. Um, but I'll ask two broader questions in the spirit of tonight's discussion. So the first question I have, and this might be beyond the scope of this project, but you list a number of improvements that are part of the recommendation for the entire development. Um, I assume the city would take it on tree planting and that sort of a thing. Typically, when is that implemented? Is that implemented as development occurs or is that usually done initially um, once a housing element is approved and then are kind of open for business. I was just curious as to what the rollout of those improvements that would be at the city's expense would look like. Typically, the improvements are tied to when projects come in. Got we it. take advantage of that opportunity, and uh, the uh, developer will actually be required to do some of the improvements as well. And I think at that time, you take the advantage of the opportunity to do the, uh, any city improvements that can be done at the same time. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I did have another question written down, but since I can't seem to locate it in my more specific questions, I think I will reserve the balance and turn it back over to the mayor for now. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll just say that, oh. you know, I thumbed through this uh, in preparation for tonight's meeting, and I just wanted to thank all of the staff and um, all of the members of the community that have participated in both the mind mixer sessions and everything else that went into this. It's um, uh, when I started at my comments earlier this evening, um, I realized that the community and staff and the consultants have put uh, hours and hours into this as well as uh, the commissions. So um, I know, and I had a chuckle when I saw my colleague with his several pages of questions um, that uh, this isn't something, uh, and frankly, this isn't something that should be rushed in my opinion. Uh, and the other thing is that this is maybe the uh, first and maybe last time that the council will actually have to be able to provide um, its in-depth uh, questions and uh, input onto or into. 
Uh, therefore, I think uh, it is very important that we give it uh, its due diligence. I do uh, like a lot of the things that I've seen in there. I do have some questions related to uh, the different modalities of transportation, how that's integrated into the plan. Um, and I think there's been some very well thought out con conceptual drawings, but as we know, that also is pie in the sky until we find people to be able to put in the capital. Uh, but I do like the way that you've worked with and has, has been brought up, um, integrating the housing elements um, and some of the other uh, visions that we've had for the community um, to be able to take us um, into the future. So thank you for that. All right. Any discussion on uh, when you'd like to have this come back? So I, I originally uh, had proposed perhaps the second meeting in uh, January uh, after some consideration um, and some feedback uh, from a colleague. Uh, I would propose uh, to ensure that we give this its due time and consideration that perhaps a special uh, study session is in order, uh, perhaps uh, 8.30 p.m., or I'm sorry, 8.30, geez, we'll never get out of here, 6.30 p.m. on January the 8th, 2024. Uh, I don't know if that uh, works for everyone. Yeah, that would be fine for me. It, I can it, make it work. Is that a Monday? January That's a Monday. 8th? Monday, January 8th, 2024. Yeah. That works for us and the consultants. Okay. All right, good idea. And, and you'll, you'll calendar it and send it out? Yes, we will. Thank you. Then I would move that we continue this item to January, 20, January 8th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. in the uh, uh, council uh, chambers, uh, study session chambers, conference room. Second. Any opposition? January 8th. So uh, it looks like a vote of 5-0. Five 5-0. Zero. Five zero. And 6.30 is acceptable to everybody? We'll be, yep. we'll be here till about 1? 3. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the coffee machine's working, I'm good. You're, you're good. I, uh, during, during the break, I had... Few people mentioned the fact you said, you said we'll be here to about one, and they start they started drifting out the door. <laughs> so I was going to say that look. consent calendar, we actually accomplished more <laughs> by pulling those items than I think we've done in the last year and a half in that much time. Yeah, but some people said, "Holy Christ, one o'clock!" I I can see it coming. All right, I think we'll uh, recess the. I had wanted. I found my question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the other broad question I have, I found it, is um, you had mentioned that the specific plan didn't include any additional open space, but that would be accounted for in some of the design elements and the public-private stuff that you have planned. Uh, I want to get a sense of, I guess I was surprised by that a little bit, because in some of the community groups, that seemed to be a high-priority item for some members that I had spoken with, additional space and everything else. And so I was a little surprised that that didn't get factored into expanding the existing space or creating a new green space, if you will, and why the decision was made to um, go that route, the you know the private development route, instead of expanding a park or something like that. So would you be able to elaborate on that and, and some of the feedback you'd gotten from the community and why you made that decision? Uh, yes, definitely, and and that's absolutely correct that we did hear definitely a um, want and need for community gathering space, for outdoor seating, for recreation. Um, we heard community interest in things that had been proposed on the Pioneer Square project and having that sort of uh, environment. Um, on page 66 of the plan, you'll see there's requirements in every project for um, private and for common open space. And then we also included uh, publicly accessible open space on projects of a certain site size. And that um, basically there are standards for publicly uh, accessible open space and being open to the general public from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And so basically trying to roll that into development projects over a certain site size. It could be partial use for commercial uh, benefit for, you know, outdoor seating for restaurants or that sort of a nature or, you know, ice cream or coffee shop. Um, but it can also be a um, uh, recreational space just depending on how it fits into the development. 
um, rather than does it. So there would be open space required, but it's not designated in a separate zone. It also allows for flexibility within a development project to how they're going to kind of where exactly it's going to be cited and how it's going to be kind of rolled into the development. So that's why we went with that approach. Okay. Yeah, a, a good example would be, if you recall, the concept plans for PSQ that included uh, public gathering space sure. and public amenities. So under the current draft, a project of that scope of that size would be required to provide that public gathering space. Okay. Um, so the only feedback and comment I have on that is that if we are envisioning additional housing and a growth in the city's population, what that would translate likely to is increased demand for fields and other type of athletic, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? I thought I heard an echo. Uh, fields and other types of athletic facilities which wouldn't really be served by the type of um, amenities that Pioneer Square had, right? You would need, and as it is, some of the fields are already pretty heavily uh, subscribed. So I would encourage just thinking about additional green space where you could account for increased Little League participation, increased soccer, right? Other types of things, pickleball I think was mentioned, because if you do increase the population, we may find ourselves in a situation, especially if most of that population is happening down in the downtown core, um, the options for being able to use the fields that are within that area at Marchand Park and others, there's, it, it's going to be over capacity pretty soon. So that's something I would advise in thinking through this. But otherwise, with my other com uh, colleagues' comments about the effort put in this and the thought, I agree it's very well done. So thank you. And I reserve the balance of my questions for the study session. I just want to say I like uh, Eric's thought on, on the open space, or at least uh, appreciate the, the the concern for some large areas of open space, um, larger than just a, you know, a plaza with a fountain and benches around it, and, and you know, being more green as well. In, in addition, I mean, the plaza is a great idea. And one thing is uh, maybe the developers could be encouraged, I mean, I don't know how feasible this would be, but to think outside the box in the sense of thinking outside the specific plan. So, for example, there might be some property, and I know this would cost them money, but it's built into the could be built into the development if uh, it's all uh, combined and and put in a fund or something like that. But maybe purchasing some property, like just right outside, like on Arrow Highway, some of the industrial property that may not be needed. Uh, maybe maybe it's a future housing element site, but maybe it could be a field or something like that. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm trying to think of where the large expanse of field space would be within the plan. And um, maybe it comes out of those 3,687 units, and so we're, you know we don't need as many units, but we trade it off for some requirements for open space. I, I do want to know, so if, if that's a consensus from the council, we can certainly look into it, but it's also important to note that currently um, any residential development and or commercial development would be required to pay into our our parking pack fees, so our Quimby fees. So we use those funds to either um, maintain existing uh, parks and fields or potentially uh, create new ones as well. Okay. All right, any further questions? Thank you very much for your time. I imagine we'll see you on the 8th, right? Good. Jennifer, time to go home. In case anybody doesn't know it, Jennifer Williams worked for us for quite some time, and, uh, and she worked with Louis, so I'm not sure why he's not trying to steal her back. Thank you very much. Wait. Okay, well, we're gonna, at this time, we're going to take a recess of the uh, city council meeting, and we're going to move into the San, uh, San Dimas Housing Authority. That's open. <laughs> Approval of the uh, Housing Authority minutes. I'll move approval. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The next point of business will be appointment of members of the authority, the chair, and executive director. Nominations are open. Nominate the mayor for the chair. 
Can I dispute that? <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, any further nominations? Oh. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, uh, the mayor will be the chair. Executive director? Nominate the city manager. You can't dispute it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Well, uh, administrative services agreement between the city of San Dimas, San Dimas Housing Authority and the city of San Dimas uh, is estimated about 316,000 Lily Flores. Um, this was a pretty straightforward presentation. This agreement authorizes the reimbursement from the housing authority to the general fund for the staff uh, that performed the work for the housing authority. Move approval as proposed. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. Receive and file a housing authority annual audit report. Recognize Lily Flores. I can do the report for this one as well. Uh, this just basically is a synopsis of the activity that took place for the housing successor. Uh, it's required every year that we prepare the report and post on our website. Um, the main thing about this report is it calculates the excess surplus, which uh, three years ago we had first started the clock on an excess surplus of 648,000. Uh, at this time we had to begin spending that money for uses and improvements at Monta Vista and other low income uh, project areas. Uh, we were able to decrease the fund balance enough that we met that threshold. However, there's still an existing excess surplus that we'll have to use, utilize the rest of that by the end of this current fiscal year in order not to have to return those funds to the state. At the time when it was first calculated, the, the fund balance was $3.6 million. We've now reduced it down to $2.1. Uh, so we'll have to continue to, to utilize those funds so that we are not in threat of returning those to the state. Uh, other activity, we transferred the Taylor property to Habitat for Humanity so they could build that housing project that we asked them to do as part of the transfer. And uh, we also utilized some of the funds to make the bond payment at Charter Oak. And that concludes my report. Do we have any idea when the uh, Habitat is going to actually move forward with that project? So they have until March as to when the transfer took place. They have a year to begin uh, groundbreaking, otherwise... They have to make a payment towards the property. So the anticipation is that they're going to begin that by March. I've got my tool belt and hard hat ready. Just yes. <laughs> just let me know. All right. Any further questions from Mike? Uh, of Mike? No. Hearing none. Thank you, Michael. Okay. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to close the uh, uh, housing authority meeting. Wait. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's close. At this time, we'll move into the uh, San Dimas Public Facilities Financing Corporation. Approve uh, Public Facilities Finance Corporation minutes. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Mo motion approve. 5 0. Appointments of members of the corporation President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer. I'll nominate uh, the mayor for president, the mayor pro tem, uh, Ryan Vienna, for vice president, and uh, secretary treasurer. Let's see, who wants to be that? Is that you, Chris? It's city manager. Chris and Chris Constantine, city manager, secretary treasurer. Any further nominations? <laughs> okay. All in favor of the mayor, the mayor pro tem, and the city manager? Oh, wait, we need, I think we need a second. Just also, to clarify, the second was made by Councilmember Weber. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 None. You're, you're none. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Motion carries 5 0. We're getting a little gloomy here. All right. At this point, we're going to move into oral communications. Members of the audience, speakers are less limited to uh, three minutes or as may be determined by the chair. Anyone wishing to speak to the council at this time? Oh, they all left. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on to city manager's reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just two updates. On Saturday, December 2nd, the city held its signature event, the holiday extravaganza. 
Obviously, you all saw it. It was a great success, and I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to staff from Parks and Recreation and Public Works for their hard work and efforts for that event. I think it was the best one we've had so far. The tree looked beautiful with our staff doing the tree in-house as opposed to contracting it out at a price of half the cost of what we paid last year and much cheaper next year since we bought the lights. So we look uh, forward to what next year would bring. The City Council uh, will be holding a special council meeting on December 20th. The purpose of this meeting is related to the election. We only received one candidate for the position of mayor, um, and that offers us the opportunity to take an action and certify the eligibility and appoint the mayor to that position, which would avoid having to put one name on the ballot to run for mayor, which would save us approximately a cost of $100,000. And so that's the recommendation we're making from staff to consider on the 20th. With that, Mr. Mayor, I would turn it to you. Thank you. Any questions of the city manager? City attorney? I have no reports, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Members of the council, council members reports on meetings attended at the expense of the local agency. Seeing none, we'll move on to city council requests for future items. John. Uh, first of all, yes, the holiday extravaganza was great and wonderful. And I do want to thank uh, everybody in the community who came out because that was that's what makes it, of course, um, and all the people there was great. The uh, business owners uh, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce, business owners along the uh, corridor there and the Chamber of Commerce, our staff, of course, which worked like incredibly a lot uh, in the days and days and weeks leading up to it. Um, and of course, all of my fellow city council members, we were all there. And uh, it was a great, great event. So congratulations, kudos. Thanks a lot uh, to everybody. So appreciated all of that. And then the only other thing is that the holiday season is upon us. And I just wanted to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a happy holidays. And again, um, that goes out to the entire community, to, to our staff, who, whom I uh, really want to express my appreciation for the last year of, of all their work and everything we've got accomplished and um, how we're handling uh, things that may be a little difficult to handle. Um, and then uh, to my fellow council members, I just want to say I do appreciate you all. And um, I feel that it's a, a blessed time of year. And uh, so Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nakano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have several items, but I'll go through them very quickly. So first, I just want to thank the staff for putting on a great extravaganza. It was outstanding, and I was uh, very proud to be a part of it. It was, it was delightful. So thank you for your hard work and for making it special. Second, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for their mixer and for just all the work they do throughout the year in general. So thank you to those who are involved with the Chamber. Without you, our city would be much less so. So thank you. I want to thank Margie Green for organizing the window decorating contest. So it was a lot of fun. It's an annual tradition. It's on my calendar. Thank you for your hard work in organizing that and putting that on. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor for organizing the city staff lunch. It was a great idea. I had fun. Um, and even with the press conference that day, we navigated it. I think um, everybody really appreciated it. I hope it becomes an annual tradition. So thank you for starting a new San, uh, San Dimas tradition here in town. Um, I want to uh, wish good luck to all the candidates who are running for office. I know that you bring the vitality of your experience, the wisdom, and uh, a new perspective or old perspective to council. Uh, we look forward to a, um, a robust discussion of the issues that are facing the city, and we'll welcome whoever uh, wins in that election. So thank you for that. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank the sheriff's office for their hard work in capturing that individual who allegedly committed these very serious crimes, uh, not just here, but in Los Angeles. Thank you for, your, for making uh, an arrest so quickly, working with um, several departments, which I know is not often easy to do. Uh, I thank all the officers involved and salute you for your leadership, Captain Ash. So thank you for that. And finally, I wanna wish everybody here a happy holidays, whatever your traditions may be. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this time of gratitude and reflection. And I look forward to working with and seeing all of you in the new year. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Nicon uh, Mr. Weber. 
Um, I will echo everybody's sentiments. The, the holiday extravaganza was fantastic. Um, tons of my friends from out of town came. Uh, they, they enjoyed it with me. And it, it, uh, it really is a huge draw for everybody, just uh, not only in San Dimas, but uh, also in the entire region. So I think everybody knows that we put on a good uh, holiday uh, get together and the word's getting out because I think the past three years or so, uh, you've noticed a uh, much larger presence at uh, the holiday extravaganza every year. And I think we handed out a dump truck load full of candy too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how much it was, but 42 pounds, 42 pounds of candy. So, um, we might start getting some, uh, some claims from parents in the city for, uh, dental bills at some point, but, uh, that might be further down the road, but it was a fantastic event. Thank you to everybody that made that happen, uh, in the community, our, uh, our staff, of course, um, it, the hard work pays off and, and people really do notice. So, uh, bravo on that. Um, I wanted to congratulate Gary Enderley. Uh, I know he came in at the beginning of the meeting and, and uh, uh, we congratulated him on his uh, retirement from Sandy Miss Heroes, but I just wanted to send my personal uh, congratulations to Gary. I know that uh, he's been a member of the community for many, many years. Uh, I've known him since uh, I was 11 years old when he was involved with uh, building the Louis Pompey Memorial over by Vons. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, even though he's... Um, Stepping down from San Dimas Heroes, that he's still going to be a staple around town, and uh, we'll uh, run into him quite often, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I guess the only thing left to say is uh, happy holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, whatever it is that you celebrate. Uh, it, this time of the year is always kind of busy and hectic, and we get caught up in uh, the, the daily grind. So make sure that uh, you stop for a minute, take a breath, enjoy the family time, and, uh, and enjoy the holidays, too. That's it. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to take the mayor's line. Oh, it's the best part about going last. Everybody's pretty much said everything. So I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> well, I got to say it too now. Yeah, you say it after. <laughs> um, I echo the sentiment. The holiday extravaganza was fantastic. Well done by staff. Uh, I also uh, commend your... Um, fiscal prudence and responsibility and being able to put on a high quality event while looking at ways to be uh, fiscally prudent. And uh, so um, I don't think uh, from the production side of it that anyone would even know uh, the different things that we did uh, to be able to um, save some costs and make some solid investments. And so I think, um, you know, that's not, uh, fallen on me and so really well done. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Um, also, uh, many people do come and come from all over and I do agree with, uh, you know, my colleagues that this event has continued to build and, uh, you know, we've, I've watched it grow and grow and grow and it seems like we just keep doing bigger and better. So, uh, well done. I will say I did accept the, uh, candy toss challenge from staff and I ran out. Um, so I ran out right about the stage. So I need two more bags next year, I think. And uh, that should get us there. So um, well done though. Also, uh, I do, I too want to thank the chamber. The holiday mixer was fantastic. Uh, I think that, you know, everybody that uh, comes out from not just, uh, you know, our civic organizations, but the chamber is huge uh, and really is there and is a active part of the community, like our local community as well as our business community. So I am very, uh, very grateful for them and for all they do year round. And that event was very awesome. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, all the other groups in the community that have done some really awesome things. Uh, Rotary, the Masons, um, even uh, Toys for Tots. A lot of people have done some really awesome things during this holiday season. Uh, and those things uh, I think are, are just fantastic examples of the quality people and uh, businesses that we have here in the community. Um, also to that end, the Sheriff's Department uh, this past Saturday had a toy drive and uh, I know some folks, while I didn't get a chance to be there, I saw plenty of pictures and know plenty of people that did go. Um, so my hat's off to you on that, another successful year. The horses are always a hit, um, so good job there. 
Also, um, I want to commend all of the Sheriff's Department personnel uh, that uh, were involved in the tragic event that occurred uh, up in northern San Dimas uh, that actually happened at during the time we were getting ready for our council meeting, last council meeting. Uh, within 48 hours, the uh, Sheriff's Department, its resources, uh, the technology all came together and we were able to identify uh, the person responsible uh, as everything seems to line up for these uh, crimes and bring that person to justice. So um, my hat's off to everyone, homicide, the deputies that responded, um, as well as the deputies who responded's ability to be smart uh, persons in the world of technology today. Uh, I think that is uh, something that is just very commendable of our field deputies, and we're very blessed to have some very smart people patrolling the streets here. Um, and I also want to point out to people when they ask why it is that you know we don't use, uh, don't have another uh, police department, whether it's our own or we look at other agencies. Uh, I will tell you the the resources that come together when something like that happens are second to none, and everything that this community benefits from. Um, contrary to what the, the mayor may say, uh, the sheriff's department has the best homicide team in the nation. And, uh, and I know he knows that in his heart, but, um, heart of hearts, but, uh, nevertheless, uh, you'll get your turn in a minute. Hold on. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> who, who do you, you work for? Right? Yeah. You know, well, you know, I work in public safety. Um, but all that being said, I do think that this was a great example of not just the investment that this community's made in public safety, but also the resources that we're able to pull together in a regional approach to be able to bring someone to justice and not just bring someone to justice, but then within a short time later, then be able to solve some very serious crimes, the serious crime um, that's happened regionally in this area uh, that appears to be linked to one person. So um, well done and uh, express my thanks please to everybody that was involved. And um, lastly, uh, you know, well, not lastly, I will say, you know, my heart and prayers are with uh, the victim uh, and his family. Uh, and I think that is something that, you know, the whole community was impacted uh, by this event. It was very tragic, um, very unfortunate. Uh, that person also was uh, an employee of the County of Los Angeles. Uh, so that person was very loved. Uh, I know um, Supervisor Barger and I had a, a conversation and, you um, she just said this person was a, a very smart, very uh, dedicated employee uh, and a great person. So um, I know he's missed, uh, not just here in the city, but uh, all around. That said, uh, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, everyone um, on the city council uh, as we all did attend the press conference uh, for this uh, specific event and thank our captain uh, for being able to work with uh, the city manager and Chris for pulling council together. I think that, you know, what from the members of the community that I heard from, um, I think it's no secret that San Dimas has always prioritized public safety. Uh, and I think that the feedback uh, that I received from uh, the messaging that was sent by the entire council's presence at that event was powerful. Uh, and I think it's powerful for people to know. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that this city um, is a place where we do prioritize public safety and the safety of the citizens, our students, uh, and our businesses. And so for everybody. And um, I thank the council for that because I think it was something um, that needed to be shown. And I also want to commend the mayor. Uh, you know, the mayor, uh, if you didn't get a chance to see his remarks, uh, I think you should watch that press conference from the sheriff's department um, and you'll understand why he is the mayor and why I believe he's unopposed um, because I think the mayor does a very good job uh, in consensus building, but also getting to the point. And I think um, your comments, mayor, were uh, I think representative of, uh, I think the, the whole council and I think uh, not just that, but the sentiment of the community. So thank you for your words. Um, and thank you for pointing out the council's priorities and investing in those areas to be able to keep our community safe. And lastly, I'm going to say Merry Christmas to everybody. Happy Hanukkah, if that's what you celebrate, Kwanzaa, any of the other holidays. Um, bottom line is, everybody, please be safe. Have a wonderful end of the year. Uh, to the staff, thank you so much for another awesome year. Um, John.
it's, I, I'm having, I'm struggling. I'm gonna have uh, separation anxiety is already starting. So I have to cherish the uh, remainder of our time together. But uh, you know, I've had a lot of fun with you this year. Uh, I think we've done some cool things and I think the council's done a lot of cool things. And uh, Nakano, you coming on board has been a lot of fun and you know, finding the areas where we have been able to work together and um, you know, you too, Weber, and uh, Mayor, you know, of course. But I've really enjoyed this year. I think that uh, when I reflect back on our accomplishments this year, I think we, uh, you know, came on board. We had a change in council. We all kind of got together, and then we really started uh, making a lot of progress in a lot of really awesome areas. And so I've really appreciated um, your perspective, uh, and I think, um, you know, the council together has moved forward uh, from a very challenging time that it was in uh, just a couple years ago. So um, thank you for an awesome year. Uh, and lastly, I wish everyone a very happy new year and uh, look forward to getting into it in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I get to say it. Everything's been said that I would say. <laughs> and so I, the, the reality is that we've had a great year. Okay, and um, I think the entire city council um, absolutely re realizes that we have a great community, and I believe our community realizes it. At the, at the extravaganza, I can't tell you how many people walked up and said, this is absolutely great. I don't live in the city of San Dimas, but I'm coming here every year, and we get that for our... our uh, Music in the park, we get that for almost every event this city has, the birthday barbecue. Uh, we're a very open community, and, the, and this region knows it. And uh, it, it's a great, great feeling. Uh, the parade, we had a great parade. Uh, we, we commented and kidded around about 46 pounds of candy. The reality is we had a couple elves out there in the beginning of the tree in a and he uh, pull in a cart, and we had an elf in training. And they put out somewhere around 40, 50 pounds of chocolate. So there was a lot more than 46 pounds, and I want to, you know, I'd be remiss if when I go home, if, I, if my wife, if I didn't mention the elves, my wife Pam Badar and, and Susie Crawford, uh, they, they dress up, they become festive, and uh, Charlie McCants, who was here a little earlier, was an elf in training. And um, I, I think everybody had a great time, and you could see it. All the restaurants, you went into any restaurant we had, even uh, Rodi's was open, Pizzetto's, Sweet Savory, uh, Vincenzo's. Um, they all would like to have a Christmas extravaganza every day. <laughs> they, 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 they voiced their, their, their approval, and it was really a good thing. And, and we go back to talking um, uh, about the, the sadness that happened two weeks ago in the council meeting when we were all notified about the tragedy up, up in the northern part of the city. Um, it, it was a tragedy, uh, but you know all the public safety partners came together. Um, and, and I know that sometimes we, we talk about our kid around with Ryan and... and and Eric, both of which are in a police departments. Uh, the reality is, and we all know who has the better homicide unit. They all wear one color. They can't even, they don't have to pick between green and beige and figure out, but they all wear blue and we know it and, and they know it. But the reality is the sheriff's department, their investigation helped LAPD solve three murders within a couple of days. Okay, and I'll, I'll take my hat off to that because actually it was less it was less it was less than 48 hours I think it was somewhere around 38 hours they had a suspect in custody thanks to Beverly Hills PD <laughs> but uh, the reality is we came together as a community to support this family and we're there if, if they need us and all they have to do is call I know the sheriff's department's been in touch with them and uh We'll, we'll, we'll be there to support them. Uh, I understand from the CEO of uh, 
the county, that this guy was a great employee, very smart, very intelligent, and uh, a life taken much too short. And, uh, but it just tells us a story. We all need to remember that we know what we're doing, but we don't know what the other guy is doing. So keep your head on that, you know, that swivel that people talked about. And remember, this is a time for celebration and not a, not a time for tragedy. So at this point, I'd just like to say happy holidays. Um, feel free to call the city manager anytime you need to because he's always answers that phone at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, especially since the, some of our staff is going to be gone, but tw city hall functions 24 hours a day. All right? So happy holidays. Uh, Chris, would you please read... Uh, uh, concerning the closed sessions, please. If I may ask, there's one more item. Uh, the appointment of a city trustee to the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Board. Currently, our representative is Councilmember Vienna. Yeah, I am so moved. Motion by <clears throat> Mayor Bedar. Is there a second? From what I understand, they requested me back is, uh, is what I... It's very so complicated. So, All in yeah, favor? I, yeah. All in favor? I... Right. I guess. Motion by the mayor and seconded by Councilmember Ebner passes 5-0 for Councilmember Vienna to continue at the request of the Vector Control Board. I, I'm just going to point out that when we reorganize after whoever the new people or person is that comes on, they'll probably get to know mosquitoes. So. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> Cherry, sit while you can, Ryan. This meeting is adjourned. Uh, Mr. Oh, go Mr. ahead. Mr. Mayor. Um, at this time, the council will be going into closed session to discuss two, two items on the three items on the agenda, well, which is conference with real property negotiators, including the uh, negotiators of the city manager, assistant city manager, city attorney, and uh, um, on the other side negotiating parties, Mr. Ron Nottingham. Conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation of one case, and also including. A liability claim, which is an item that was added at the beginning of this agenda that was not known at the time the agenda was posted regarding that claim with Sylvia Yamas. With that, we will be moving into closed session. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Good night.